very grateful for the invitation from the long-standing Secretary General of the Pan-African Writers Association, the distinguished Ghanaian poet, Atukwe Okai, to be part of these proceedings and for the reorganization of your program to enable me to attend. more so for the immediacy and relevance of the theme of this year's 24th International African Writers' Day Colloquium and the book industry, urgent agenda for Africa's destiny. It has everything to do with the future of our continent. I don't know which of our languages it is that has this say. But I have heard it said that somewhere in West Africa, there is a saying that every time an elder dies, a library burns with him. You do not need to know or understand whichever of our languages this saying originated from to understand exactly what is meant. I believe we're saying that every time an elder dies, some amount of stored knowledge disappears with him. Undoubtedly, one of Africa's most revered leaders was Nelson Mandela, and he was blessed with a long life. He passed on in 2013 at the ripe age of, 20, of 95. We shall continue to miss Madiba and his influence on the continent. And there will continue to be moments when we would all wonder what he would have said or done if he were still around. But I dare say when he died, the library did not burn with him. Whilst he was still alive, a lot was written about him that survives. And modern technology means we have audio and video recordings of him that survive. He himself wrote, and his books are available to enable us to have this perspective, even though he's no longer with us. There might be disagreements on how his words and actions are interpreted and, and analyzed, but there will be no dispute on what he said and where he said it. And for those to whom these aspects are important, how he was dressed, on a particular day. There's no danger of the Mandela story being told only from the perspective of those who do not like him. For centuries, we Africans have bemoaned the fact that the African story is told largely by non-Africans who are unsympathetic to our traditions and points of view. The monumental evidence of Timbuktu and its libraries and documents notwithstanding, several amongst us accepted that there was no written history of Africa. And indeed, some claimed there was no history of this continent and its peoples. Several amongst us accepted that ours was a purely oral tradition. I'm proud, and we should all be proud, the Timbuktu exists to expose the lie that the worth of this continent and its civilization can only be measured from the time of colonization. The much respected former South African president, Thabo Mbeki, therefore deserves the undying gratitude of all of us Africans that he has had the courage to embark on the project to rehabilitate and save the ancient manuscripts and documents of Timbuktu. Every self-respecting African was horrified at the events of 2012 when self-proclaimed Islamic militants launched attacks on Timbuktu, determined to destroy the ancient manuscripts and artifacts. There should be no hesitation in condemning the barbaric attack on our collective patrimony, and we should resolve to protect 
and preserve this World Heritage Site. Timbuktu represents the tangible evidence of Africa's greatness and its contribution to scholarship and the history of humanity. It is world renowned as a center of trade and a center of research and scholarship in every aspect of human endeavor, be it science, mathematics, religion, or history. Timbuktu at its height between the 14th and 16th centuries produced and attracted artists, academics, politicians, religious scholars, and poets. It was a place where knowledge was revered. In 1526, Leo Africanus, the great Berber and Delusi diplomat and author, wrote about, and I quote, the rich king of Timbuktu and his magnificent and well-furnished court. Here are a great store of doctors, judges, priests, and other learned men that are bountifully maintained at the king's expense, and hither are brought diverse manuscripts or written books out of Barbary, which are sold for more money than any other merchandise." Unquote. Stick with ladies and gentlemen. I've gone on a bit about the scholarship that was an integral part of life at Timbuktu during its heydays. This is not meant simply to make the point that once upon a time, Africa had a world-renowned center of trade and knowledge. In my view, it is sad to boast about a rich past if debt, poverty defines your contemporary reality. I refer to Timbuktu to make the point that if Africa is to gain respect and be accorded its rightful place in the world, we have to shed the cloak of poverty that currently defines us. I refer to Timbuktu to make the point that knowledge production, scholarship and aesthetics tend to flourish when and where there is prosperity. Throughout the world, it has been shown that education provides the fastest route out of poverty. For you, who are our intellectuals, may I dare say that there is no need for us to engage in futile battles along ideological lines. Education provides the equity that we all seek. We have to get our populations educated. We have to get the skills that are required to compete in the modern economy. And we have to gain the self-confidence that comes from being truly independent. This means that you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the writers of the African story, carry a great responsibility. When you write, what you write must have integrity. What is written about Africa by African writers must have the ultimate reference status. We have a responsibility to be brutally frank to and about ourselves. There is nothing to be gained from trying to paint a false picture about ourselves as a way of redressing the centuries of being maligned. There is a place for praise singing as an art form, as entertainment, and probably as a source of genealogy. But when praise singing is offered as the official assessment of government performance, then we are inflicting as much damage as those who seek to demean Africa. When our writers produce books, treaties, articles, and dissertations that deliberately distort the truth because it serves their personal preferences, they discredit Africa. African writers have played a remarkable role in the liberation of our continent from imperialism. They have set the tone for the discourse about our identity. Many of our battles have been waged and won with the pen 
and without any guns or, or bombs. For people of my generation, it was Sheikh al Tadio, the legendary Senegalese writer and historian, who supplied the intellectual backbone to prop up our being pride in being black. Some say that for many people, Nadim Gordimer's books defined the evil of apartheid and did as much to fight apartheid as any bomb that was thrown. And the same can be said for Alan Payton's cry, The Beloved Country. Chinua Achebe opened up the joys, the pains, the bewilderment and attractions of Nigeria to the world with the majesty and power of his writing. Wolesho Inka could and continues to entertain, irritate, question, and educate with his elegantly chosen words and still leave you in no doubt about his identity. In Gugi, Wationgo fights Kenyan battles and beyond and sets out to decolonize our minds and make us take pride in Africa. Nuruddin Farah with his novels and plays, enables us to see and hear another Somalia, apart from the headline Somalia of bombs and killing fields. Our Kwisi Brew, enchanted with his poetry. Amata Edu, exemplifies in Gugi Watyongo's famous words that the written words, too, can sing. Her plays and essays capture the imagination and speak directly and unambiguously. Aikoyama's novels pronounce vividly the emotional realities and challenges of post-colonial Africa. And Nigeria's Chima Manda Ngozi Adichie leads the current pack of young writers today who are holding forth the torch of the African writers. African writers have never shacked away from any subject, and they were very prominent in the struggle for political liberation. J.B. Dankwa, the doyan of Ghana politics, wrote plays, poems, and long essays, and gave us the treatise on the Akan doctrine of God, and his scholarship gave our nation its name of Ghana. Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, was a powerful polemicist and wrote widely on politics in a variety of subjects, advancing in eloquent terms the case for the political unification of our continent. Before them, Joseph Casely Hafer, he of the Aborigines Rights Protection Society that helped at the end of the 19th century preserve indigenous control of Ghanaian lands from the greedy grasp of British colonialism, wrote Ethiopia Unbound, that set out the early Pan-African dream. Chief Obafemi Awolo and Dr. Namdi Azikwe, leading Nigerian statesmen of their era, were prolific writers. The first Senegalese president, Leopold Sedar Senghor, was an acclaimed poet and cultural theorist. It makes me begin to wonder what has happened to those that have followed the early African leaders. We do not seem to have the poet or playwright or essayist president or politicians anymore. I leave you to put your collective minds to that. <laughs> and I'll be interested in hearing what you come up with as an explanation. I dare say I should be able to make a contribution to that discourse. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I note from the theme of your colloquium that there's likely to be a battle, a battle royal fought over language, and this author of the statement has indicated that. This is a subject that has always sparked a lot of passion and is likely to continue to do so. I look forward to hearing the reports of your deliberations, which I hope will encompass the prodigious work that is being undertaken at the Center for Advanced Studies of African Society, based in Cape Coast, in Cape Town, 
excuse me, led by the Ghanaian scholar Kwesi Kwapra, which is seeking to produce unified orthographies, lexicons, and vocabularies out of the myriad of African language to facilitate their use as effective instruments of modern education, research, and social development. For the moment, suffice it to go back to Nelson Mandela, and I too will quote him when he said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart." Unquote. This, to me, reinforces the validity of the work Kwesipra and others are doing to harmonize the estimated 1,500 to 2,000 languages said to be spoken in Africa. But as you ruminate over that one, let me tell you a story about language that should interest us all. A famous American university is said to have introduced a special course in Mandarin Chinese in 1994. Very few students turned up, and for the next five years, there was pressure to give up and stop the course. Fortunately for all concerned, the university persisted and kept the unpopular course going. In the past five years, this course in Mandarin Chinese is the most popular course in the university, with standing room only in the lecture room. I doubt that the course has become any more difficult or easier. What has happened since 1994, though, is that the status of China in the world has changed dramatically. Students can see the evidence of this, of this change all around them. They do not need to be coaxed or coerced into taking a course to, uh, to learn the Chinese language. They know it is in their interest to learn that language. I believe there is a lesson in, in there for us which extends beyond language. When our young people do not see a future in their countries and cross the Sahara Desert on foot and drown in the Mediterranean Sea in a desperate bid to reach the mirage of a better life in Europe, no amount of beautiful lyrics will change our image. When our economies grow and improve, our young people get educated and are self-confident and full of hope. The world finds its way to our doors, and the language and history of our countries become attractive to our own and foreign universities. When the African economies improve and there's increasing prosperity, we will find that more and more people will care about the environment and the, and the arts, and indeed, the sciences will thrive. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, distinguished writers of Africa, tell the African story truthfully and with flair. Give praise where it has been earned and criticism where it is deserved. When the integrity of the writer is compromised, the library is well and truly burnt. I count on you to keep alive the libraries in your various communities, for that indeed is part of the urgent agenda for Africa's destiny. Our generation has a special responsibility to be the harbingers of a new African civilization, founded on the values of liberty, common humanity, and solidarity, which will lift the long-suffering African masses out of poverty into prosperity. An Africa which no longer depends on charity aid and handouts, an Africa which mobilizes Africa's own immeasurable resources to address Africa's problems, an Africa that has the capacity to deal with other continents on the basis of equality and mutual respect. Truly, the project has to be Africa beyond aid.